So yeah, today we're going to be talking about building a true data bet. The true data platform going beyond the modern data stack. Um, so right, there we go. Yep. So this is me, head of data engineering and DevRel at Dexter Labs. If you're not already on Slack, I'd encourage you to join us. The link is below. We'll be in the Dexter Deep Dive channel after this talk, answering questions. So feel free to, you know, ask in the Q and A. And if you don't get to it, we can talk as well in the channel. So we'll cover three things really today. Um, a little bit about this unkept promise of the modern data stack. We'll talk a little bit about how that leads to the rise of the data platform engineer. And then from there, we're going to talk about how to build a unified data platform using Dexter. So first, I want to start a little bit about this whole modern data stack idea, right? Um, I'm not going to go talk too much about what it is. I think at this point, you've probably heard a million de different definitions of it. But I think, you know, Largely, we know it's been a reaction to the previous generation of tools. And in many ways, it's a lot better than what we used to have. I don't think anyone would argue that they want to go back to the days of managing Hadoop clusters or on-prem servers uh, just to do data analytics. But at the same time, you know, we found there's probably some issues with the way uh, sort of the data stack has evolved over time. So one thing we've seen a lot with the modern data stack is um, they've promised us these things like benefits, uh, these benefits like scaling, flexibility, and mod modular architecture. But that's not always without fault, right? Um, if you think about sort of the modern data stack's promise that you could go out and get these best of breed tools, um, that is true. But at the same time, you end up with a lot of issues when it comes to uh, scaling, for example, or being able to negotiate contracts, just like these um, hidden cost, I would say. And so in many ways, what ended up happening with the modern data stack is like this unbundling of Airflow. Now, this is from a blog post um, from Fal, who actually took down the post where they pivoted it to AI, as we all do over time. But uh, the post itself was great. The image is taken from that post. And really what, what this kind of demonstrates is that we used to have this like monolithic architecture where we would do everything within Airflow and we started to break out the compute and the compute got outsourced to all these special tools of their own, which, you know, is actually great. It's uh, kind of that Unix philosophy we've talked a lot about. But one of the downsides of this is that every single tool has its own concept, its own orchestration, and it can become really hard to understand like sort of the state of things, right? You can imagine you are um, trying to understand what's going on in Fivetran. You would have to log into that platform. You'd have to click in a bunch of logs try to find the right page and then understand sort of the state of things. And then you would go on to your next tool like BBT and similar, similar process, right? And so if we think about like the benefits of this unbundled data stack, uh, there are many, but I think there's three that we don't talk about too often, which is really this lack of observability, a lack of orchestration, and it can be quite expensive and sticky. And I love this uh, quote by Nath who said like, really the modern data stack is a set of vendor tools that solve niche problems. And the side effect is creating a disjointed data workflow that makes everything more complicated, which I think we can start to relate with a lot these days. So let's talk a little bit about these three things, right? Like on the observability front, it's really hard to know the state of your entire data platform, right? You have uh, logins to every single application, different UIs, and you really don't know what's going on at any given moment without having to go through all these extra steps. And the other thing is like this really little or no orchestration at all involved. I mean, the best you get is maybe a cron job. If you're really, really lucky, you might have a webhook. And that's that's it uh, with a lot of these tools. Uh, so you end up, you know, just creating these large buffers of time between events, hoping that, you know, everything kind of completes in time. And then the order sort of magically just takes care of itself. And we find that often, you know, that's not enough. And the other really downside of this thing is that it can be really expensive and sticky. So once you've migrated to one of these solutions, you're often stuck with vendor lock-in, negotiations become tougher, bills get higher, and you find that what seemed like a simple, you know, low-cost solution suddenly becomes a five or six-figure bill very, very quickly. And so this kind of leads to this idea I've been seeing, which is really the rise of the data platform engineer. This is something I've been observing as I've talked to a few different companies. Um, and what, what's really happening is that people are starting to feel the pain of you know these many different frameworks and many different tools. 
and a lack of a cohesive structure. And these data engineers are taking it upon themselves to go out and build a platform that sort of brings these things together. And that's what I'm calling this data platform. And in fact, I think everyone really has a data platform. It really is just a matter of like the quality and experience of your platform. And what, what we're really seeing is some of the best data engineers are going out and building really you know thoughtful and cohesive platforms that really serve their stakeholders. And if we come back to a post actually I wrote uh, last year, uh, it builds upon this idea by Jeff Magnuson from 2016, which is a lot longer ago than it feels, eight years, I think, right? So um, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away, Jeff Magnuson wrote, engineers should not write ETL. And we all read this post and we thought, wow, what a great idea. We'll never write ETL again. Um, that didn't happen. So instead, what happened, I think, is we outsourced ETL to a bunch of SaaS tools, which probably is a better solution than making data scientists write ETL. To be honest, we've all seen the code data scientists write. We don't love that. Uh, let's offload that to SaaS platforms and make them work on it. But what we didn't do is like follow up on the next step of that journey that Jeff told us to, to go through, which is having data engineers build frameworks and not pipelines. I think a lot of us are still building building a lot of pipelines. And a lot of that is because our stakeholders are not skilled enough or they don't have the right languages or the right tools to build the, the pipelines themselves. So it becomes incumbent on us to build them. But what we're hoping for, I think all of us, is that you know those days, maybe they don't go away completely, but they reduce in the number of hours a week we spend on these things. And we move on to something a bit more exciting, a bit more interesting, which is building platforms and frameworks and services. And so what I really think is going to happen and what I, I'm already seeing a little bit at some of the more mature companies is this data platform engineer. Now, obviously, this is not something new that we invented last year. This has been going on for a long time, but I've really been seeing a rise in this type of role. And it's really a role that is tasked not with building the pipelines, but making it possible for their consumers to build any pipeline they need without having to resort to a complex higher language, right? Uh, it's kind of this medium code movement that our founder, Nick Schrock, talks a little bit about as well. And so if we think about like data platforms, right? Like everyone has one, I think at the end of the day, you have Fivetran, you have DBT, you have a data platform. You have Google Sheets and you're doing a sum on a row or a column, you have a data platform. Like we've all, we've, we've all got one. But I think what's interesting is if we start to think about like, what is a good data platform, right? Like what, what are the qualities of a data platform that make it good to work with? What are the types of data platforms that we can build that really help propel your business forward? That's, I think, where we start to get into some really interesting conversations. And at Dexter, we have some ideas, right? We think a good data platform really falls along these three things. One is it must be scalable and maintainable. It must have high quality governance, and you need data observability and insights. And so I'll talk a little bit about these things, and I'll give examples a little bit later. So on the scalability and maintainability, this is like the, the bread and butter, I think, of a good data platform. It must scale with your data maturity. And so what I mean by this is like, you don't need the biggest, most complex platform to start, right? Like if your data maturity is low, then Google Sheets is probably a perfect you know, data platform for you. But as you evolve though, you need to start thinking about like, okay, what does it look like one, two, three years out and start planning for the maturity of your company to evolve? Hopefully your company's data maturity evolves. Like that's the thing that we want to see. We want to see, you know, some sort of like evolution and how we treat and handle data. And often it's incumbent on the data team to encourage and enable that. Um, on smaller teams, when you're just like 15 people in a room, maybe all you need is a spreadsheet. As your teams mature, as tooling evolves, as your sales team and marketing team expands, you want a data platform that can grow with that, right? So what this means is you don't want a platform that constrains you, right? Like if you are locked in a little box and you hit a brick wall as soon as you try to go complex, that's probably not a good solution uh, for data platforms. And when I talk about scaling, I'm not really talking about scaling data as much. I think scaling data is kind of a self problem, right? You can just throw it in a warehouse, you can throw it at DuckDB and you know, for almost every use case that works fine. I think what, what's really interesting is how do we scale teams, right? What happens when you have multiple stakeholders working? What happens when you hire ML engineers and data analysts and have different sets of dependencies? You know, what, what do we think about that? On the data quality and governance side, this is really about, you know, is your data good, which is always important, right? Can you test it? Can you assert facts about my data? 
can you alert on your data when it goes wrong, when things are slow, when things don't get updated? And are you are you part of a software development lifecycle, which includes you know testing, development, pull requests, version control, all the stuff software engineers have like figured out 15 years, 20 years ago? Like we should have this as well. And then when it comes to data observability and insights, really your data platform, you should be able to look at it and understand it. You shouldn't have to click through 25 different tools to figure out the state of things. Like ideally, your data platform encompasses the tools, brings them together, and allows you to observe the state of things as they are. This is really important for you know yourself, your pipeline builders, but all your stakeholders, right? Because if someone cares about some you know downstream notebook and they want to know if the data that feeds that notebook is up to date, well, how do they do that? Do they email you and ask you to hit you up on Slack? Or is there a platform they can log into and view, you know, the state of things, their dependencies and all that? That's really important as well. And so that's like sort of the goals. You want to build a platform that has these things. I also like to think about qualities, like, you know, what does a good data platform feel like? What are its vibes? And I think there's, I came up with four, there's probably 25 different ones we can come up with here, but I think it must encompass that software development lifecycle, like through and through. It's got to feel like software development. We really believe data engineering is software engineering at its core. And you can only really do data platforms well if you're doing data engineering and software engineering well. And that means, you know, testing. It means version control. It means being able to branch. It means having a good local development story. And your development story must feel good, right? Like nobody likes working with tools that suck. That's why people hate working with Azure Data Factory. It's just not a good experience. People will quit their jobs before they're forced to use you know, those tools. So it's important to also have things that feel good to work with and are fun and you know, at least not bad, right? Like that's ideally like the, the best case scenario. The other thing we really want is for it to support heterogeneous, heterogeneous, you know, varied use cases. Um, data platforms have to accommodate all kinds of things, you know. We'd all love it if everyone used one language and one tool and like we just like forced every marketer to learn Python. Like that would be, you know, the best case scenario, but that's never going to happen. Uh, so maybe we need to support things like SQL or maybe even YAML, well, you know, all kinds of different types of languages and different tools. And we got to like bring them all together. And when I say bring them all together, I really mean bring them all together. I <laughs> love the ADF jobs. Me too. Uh, I got so many. Uh, we got to build a monolith. Like you can't, you can't have 27 airflow deployments at an org like it's not going to work. Um, it just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because then you, you, no one knows what's going on. You need a single data plane. You need one place that every team can look at and be like, oh, that's what X team is working on. I'm an ML engineer. I want to know whether or not my data analyst, you know, has data that I can consume downstream of them because, you know, maybe I need some Salesforce data to create a lead scoring model. Well, I don't want to talk to people. Like that's the worst case scenario. Uh, so what's my alternative to talking to someone, obviously like a plain idea of software tooling. And so we want tools that enable people to understand the cohesive nature of your data plane without forcing you to talk to people unless you want to. Um, that's, you know, ideal. And finally, declarative workflows. You got to have a little bit of declarative in there. Um, we all love to declarative workflows. That's why we use SQL. Um, that's why we don't tell the compiler what to do anymore because we've evolved with species beyond that. Imperative is nice. Sometimes you just want to cron schedule and that's fine. Like, uh, you know, sometimes you just say run at eight o'clock in the morning. I don't care. Just do it. That's fine. But as your data platform evolves, as it becomes more complex, as you have, you know, 27 different stakeholders and 15 competing priorities and your kids are screaming in the background, like you just want to say, you know, figure it out. I got to go. I got stuff to do. That's what declarative workflows is really all about. So that's the vibe of a good data platform. So let's talk a little bit about how we can build some of these things um, with Dexter. Now, Dexter didn't like think about all these things independently and come up with them from first principles, although it can feel that way sometimes. A lot of this just came from like talking to customers and like, oh, we need this or we have that problem. And like by building these things, we kind of sort of realized there's like an overarching story here. And so some of these things we built kind of thinking about these things maybe not necessarily from this category, but sort of from like user needs. But I find they do kind of fit into the story really well. So that's kind of why we're talking about them here. And I think the first one is code locations. This is the reason I actually started using Dexter, um, God, five, six years ago, I think it was. I was an Airflow person and um, looking for a way out. 
really. And cold locations was one of them. So if you've ever worked on a large airflow project and you know one team wants to use Pydantic 2 and one wants to use Pydantic 1 or different versions of SQL um, Alchemy or Postgres, like it's a nightmare. Uh, Python dependencies are just like the worst thing in the world. We still haven't figured it out. I don't think even Astral is going to figure it out, to be honest. Uh, it's just intractable. And so the best thing you can do is to have isolated code locations. These are places where you can just run separate code from each other. You're not stepping on each other's toes. I got, you know, Pydantic 2. You got Pydantic 3. She has Pydantic 4. We can all have them in our own code location. We don't talk to each other about it. And we can still interact with each other's assets. We can, you know, observe that you materialize something and, you know, work on that. But you don't have that like tight coupling between assets across teams, which I think is super, super important. Obviously, we have to have code. Like uh, it's 2024, we're doing code. Like it's over, no more, no code, uh, no low code. It's just not going to work, right? Everyone who's tried it failed. Everyone who's like, oh, we can just try clicking on things. That'll solve our problem. It doesn't. It doesn't. The second you do that, you're like, okay, this works for my one specific use case. Oh, but my team needs to unzip a file. Well, we don't support that. Okay, well, great. Uh, but now I need a second tool. Uh, code. Code is great because it can do literally anything. It's it's code. Um, it's Turing complete. It's Python. Um, you can Google things. You can write code. It, here's some code that we wrote. Uh, this is some code that does a whole bunch of crazy things like call functions, right? log things, um, parse date times. Can you do that in no, no code tools? I don't know, probably not. And do you want to? Definitely not. So write code. Like, I'm not even going to justify this one. Another great one, data quality and governance. All right, let's talk a little bit about asset checks and health. So you wrote a bunch of code, you created a bunch of assets, but are they any good? Well, as a data engineer, your job is also, I'm sorry, to look at the data. And one way you can look at the data is by asserting some facts about it, right? So data quality, I think we got we got to up our game here. Um, DBT test is a great place to start. And Dankster obviously supports and reads DBT tests. You can demonstrate them as asset checks, but we should also maybe think about asserting more things about our data, right? I think, especially when things start to move into production, you got billing pipelines that matter you really want to start to assert some sort of facts about your data. You want to think, you know, holistically, what are the things about this data that make it true? You express that in Dexter as an asset check. And the nice thing is you have an asset health dashboard. You can see when it failed. You can see, you know, whether a run failed or your asset checks failed. You can even see things like, you know, your freshness alerts. So you've got data that's too old. We don't like that. Uh, I, how many times have you thought your data was running and everything was great and you had no errors? And then, you know, three weeks later, someone's like, why is my data not updating? Why is my dashboard not working? And you go and check and you forgot to turn on a schedule, right? Like, come on, we, we can do better. We can do fresh checks. We can make sure our data is at least, you know, updated daily, every week, whatever it is, right? Yeah, freshness. I talked about it. So let's look at it really, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to express freshness in Dijkster. I think the simplest is to just tell it, you know, one hour, one day, like at the very least, your assets should have some freshness check on them. And then what Dijkstra does, it'll express this as a check that you can see in the UI. But even more importantly, maybe a Slack alert that you get in Slack that tells you, hey, by the way, this is getting pretty close to not running. Or, hey, this is actually uh, not running at all. So a great way to avoid that dreaded, hey, this dashboard up to date question that we always tend to get. Change management. This is a great one. Um, so... When I was an Airflow user a long, long time ago, uh, the only way I could really test Airflow was to push to prod and wait for it to run. Uh, because my Airflow instance ran on Kubernetes and I didn't have Kubernetes on my laptop. And um, you would you just sort of had to replicate prod in order to test things, which it's kind of hard to do and really annoying. But extra, what we can do is do things called branch deployments. And that really just creates a copy of your existing Dynamics pipeline in a separate environment that is on the cloud. You can point it to you know a clone schema. So in Snowflake or other tools, you can do zero copy clones. And that's something we do actually internally at Dagster. Uh, and then you have a clone of your database and you can run your pipeline in a staging environment and see if it works, see what it looks like, test it out before you merge to master. And this is like 
like every software engineer does this all the time and maybe we should be doing this too i don't know seems like a good idea to me data observability so i think probably the thing that like defines dagster at the very most is like the asset graph so if you're familiar with dagster you probably have seen this a million times if you're not i'll talk a little bit about like this unlock when when they first launched software defined assets i think it was like two years ago now i was very confused I was a task-based person. And I'm like, what is a software defined asset? It's a mouthful. What is an asset? I don't really know what's going on. I just have a task, go run it. Um, but now I'm a convert uh, of the church of assets uh, because what software defined assets or asset graphs, all this stuff does is it really says, I don't want to hear about your tasks anymore. I don't really care what you're doing. I care what you're producing, right? I don't care that you have a DBT pipeline. I don't care that you have a pipeline that's called you know, stuff. What I want to know is what's in it. And that's really what an asset graph is. It, it takes what your pipelines are producing and it displays them in Dexter. It makes them first-class citizens. And on the surface, it's like, okay, cool. Now I got a pretty chart. Well, that's one thing you get, but you also get things like lineage, right? Instead of having lineage between tasks, you get lineage between the individual ta assets those things create. And, you know, task A and task B might not have everything connected together, right? And so we can kind of see this on the right. We have a single, like, uh, what is this? Stage cloud product users table generated by DBT. That one is going into high touch along with the Salesforce contacts. And so we can see very clearly what are the things that are feeding this particular asset? Not what are the tasks that are creating these these things, but like what are the actual underlying assets that are being created? And you get a hundred billion other cool unlocks, like, you know, being able to assert things about your data, data quality, uh, column level. Like you get so many cool things once you've like migrated to this way of thinking. Column level lineage is another great thing you can get, right? Once you have assets, once you have tables, you can actually introspect them and understand what's what's in them, right? What are the underlying columns that are in there? And then once you have that, you can say, well, okay, how are these things connected? How are they transformed with each other? And so here we have um, from our actual, you know, a real data pipeline, some column level lineage. And so we can see here, we had a, like a weak utilization percentage column. And that becomes a last week utilization percentage. So we can see there's a transform happening there, right? And we can kind of see you know, how all the columns move in and out of these tables, which is really, really helpful when you're like debugging some complex thing. Oh, what's up? Okay, data catalog, last one. And then we can go to questions. Uh, it's good to search. It's good to find. Um, like I said, we hate talking to people. We don't like, you know, uh, humans interacting with them. It's, it's very difficult as data people. So what can we do to avoid that? What can we avoid having others talk to us? Like that's even worse than talking to someone. We give them a data catalog and you say, go search, go find it. It's right there. So next time your stakeholder is like, uh, where can I find emails? Well, go search for email in the data catalog and you'll find emails. Where can I find users? Well, search for users and you'll find the users table right there, right? Where can I find all the tables that I own or my team owns or that you own or ZBT runs? Like all of this is free with the data catalog. And the nice thing about this data catalog is that it comes with everything you build, right? You don't have to have it separate. I think the worst thing in the world is to like go build a pipeline and then be like, oh, I got to go update my data catalog somewhere. Like, no, we're not doing that. We're, you've built it. We can read that. We can make that into a catalog and we can express that for everybody. So I think, yeah, I think that's really it. So I kind of blew through this. I was talking really fast, but oh, let's wrap up. We talked a little bit about the unkept promise of the modern data stack, right? We said, they promised me scalability, flexibility, and cost, but what they really gave me was a fragmented and complex ecosystem of a bunch of tools that don't talk to each other. That's not what I wanted. Um, what I really think we believe at Daxter is that if you build this unified data plane, this monolithic platform, and you can support all these different use cases, you really get a really nice data platform that's like cohesive. It's scalable. It's easy to maintain. And it's like, understandable, which is actually really, really, really interesting and really good, I think. Um, and then once you build that, I think you become a superstar. Everyone loves you. You get promoted. They give you lots of money. They shower you with gifts. Everyone loves the data team. They're like, oh, we love you. Here's some, anything you want, right? Like that's what happens when you get a data platform that works. People are just so happy. They don't know how to thank you enough. And you know, isn't that all we want at the end of the day? A lot of thank yous and a lot of money. So I think that's kind of promise that we're kind of hoping for. Uh, yeah, that's really it. So we can jump to Q and A's.
Yeah, so we've gotten a few questions uh, that I've tried to answer to the best, the best of my ability, but I'll let you take a look at some of them. Um, one that I didn't answer all the way is it's from Edson and it says, I would like to hear more about Dagster's features for data governance. For instance, it'd be nice to have some sort of data access management. For example, some user only has access to asset groups, G and H, so it can only observe those assets in the control plane. Are there any features like that on the roadmap? I don't know, um, but I know we are thinking about RBAC always, right? Um, it never ends. So that's certainly something we can consider. I honestly do not know um, what our uh, roadmap is like for that particular future though. Okay. Um, there were a couple of questions about the column level lineage and the data catalog being available in Daxter Plus or open source. I'm correct in that it's a Daxter Plus feature, right? Yeah, column level lineage is Daxter Plus, unfortunately. Okay. We have a new question here um, from Nick. It says, what would be the right way to schedule all the assets from multiple code locations? That's a great question. I mean, it really depends, right? So um, I like to think of each code location as sort of separate as much as possible. And I would start there. If there are dependencies between code locations, I think you can probably use an asset sensor, right? And have that be like the input into the pipeline. Uh, and then just, I would try as much as possible to keep them distinct because that's sort of the idea of separate code locations, but they can be shared across if, if it needs to be. Uh, it really depends on what you want. Uh, you can also look at declarative automation. I think that's probably a nice way to not have to think too fine grained about the specifics. And you can just, you know, declare that you want, you know, this and all of its dependencies to materialize at a certain cadence. All right, the questions are really coming in now. Um, I think this is a good one. Uh, this question is, how would you transition from a well-established airflow um, in a company to this Dagster approach? We have custom code and airflow and many coupled things to that system. Oh, I got it. I got the answer for you. I'll say that. Okay, here's what you do. You actually message me on Slack and I will introduce you to uh, someone on our team who is working on a solution to this exact problem that is still in the works, but we would love to talk to you about it. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, here's another question. What is your perspective of Daxter Plus and machine learning processes or LLM ops? Yeah, this is also great. Um, we use Daxter internally for LLM ops a little bit. We have in our community Slack, Ask AI, which is a Slack bot that works off our GitHub questions and all that stuff. So we have a little pipeline that works that way and pulls in stuff uh, to build the rag. So uh, I think LLM ops is just data, data ops, really. Uh, LLMs are just data. You're not training as much, right? Which actually solves a lot of the issues with you know machine learning. And so I think at the end of the day, it's just data. It's moving your data around. Uh, I think data quality, metadata becomes really, really important when you're building these things. Um, if you use some of the built-in integrations like OpenAI, you can actually observe the amount of tokens that you're consuming through Dexter Insights. And if you're using some other tooling, you can actually emit that metadata as well as a custom metric. So you can keep an eye on you know, your token count over time. If you have like a notebook that does some analysis to determine uh, the quality of your LLM responses over time, over your prompts, you can branch those out. You can observe those as well as metadata, those scores. So you can kind of keep a track on whether or not the scores are moving up or down or trending in the right direction. Yeah, and I'll say adopting an orchestrator earlier on in your development lifecycle when working with these LLMs can tend to um, produce more or like better organized code. It's kind of nice to just have it from the start and it really influences how you develop your LLM ops. Uh -huh. um, this user asks, can I use Daxter Plus and then later migrate to my own server with the open source option? That's definitely a possibility. But if you become dependent on some of the Daxter Plus only features, you'd have to remove that um, from your functionality. Yeah, but the code itself, well, 100%. Yeah, you're yeah. not locked in. Yep. Um, this user asks, can I access the data catalog programmatically? Is there any way to tag a set of data sets so I can filter in the catalog by that tag? The tagging and filtering by that tag in the catalog is definitely something that we support. Um, I'm not 
too sure about the programmatic access of the data catalog. Do you know anything about that, Pedram? I do not. But if you ask that same question in the Slack channel, we can try and find an answer for you. Yep. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions. As a reminder, we'll be in the Daxer Deep Dive Slack channel after this, and we can keep talking there. Maybe we'll take one or two more questions as a part of the live stream. Um, let's see. This person asked, for data assets using great the Great Expectations plugin, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I can answer that one. So okay. yeah, uh, you can use Great Expectations, or there's no preference. It's really up to you. Uh, it really depends on whether or not you need some of the more complex things that Great Expectations offers. Uh, but if not, you can just do you know regular asset checks as well. Yeah, I mentioned the we had a Great Expectations blog post when I did a deep dive two deep dives ago, all about data quality, and I think it's a really great option. All right, one more. Let's let's see. Oh, interesting. What are some plugins that Dagster has that would be helpful for a financial service company? What are some good integrations? Let's see. Um, I previously worked at a financial service company, and it, it really was just like all your normal data engineering problems, like replication of data. Um, so like Sling for replicating data from Postgres databases to your uh, data warehouse was really important to us. Um, any other integrations that come to mind, Pedram? I mean, you, it's Python. So any anything that supports Python, you can do, right? Uh, even if you don't have like an integration built in, maybe you need like a connector to your ERP. If that has a Python library, you can use it in Dagster. You don't have to have necessarily an integration built in. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right. Um, We'll be posting a wrap-up blog post after this, and we'll try to address all these questions that are still outstanding. And again, we'll be in Slack. But I believe that's all we have. Do you have anything to close us out, Pedram? Um, no, just join us on Slack uh, to ask some more questions. There's so many. I'm sorry, we didn't get to every single one. But I'll try and answer those over the next, I think, I have half an hour with all of you. So feel free to ask them. <laughs>